by discussing today in our panel on internet speech, truth, trust, transparency, and tribalism. So I'll first start off by introducing our esteemed panelists, and then we'll go into a few questions. Uh, please hold your questions until the end, where we will have some time for Q&A. So first, on my right, is Ambassador Karen Cornblue. Um, Ambassador Cornblue is Senior Fellow for Digital Policy at the Council on Foreign Relations. Previously, she was Executive Vice President of Nielsen, responsible for global public policy, privacy strategy, and corporate social responsibility. She previously served as U.S. Ambassador in Paris to the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, or the OECD. There, she spearheaded development of the first global internet policy-making principle and launched both the OECD's gender initiative and the Middle East North Africa Women's Business Forum. Prior to that, she served as policy director for then Senator Obama. She also served in the Clinton administration as deputy chief of staff of the U.S. Treasury Department and as director of the Office of Legislative and Intergovernmental Affairs at the Federal Communications Commission. And to my immediate right is Mike Masnick. He is the founder of the Copia Institute, which is a nonpartisan research and policy institute dedicated to understanding the issues at the intersection of technology and policy. Um, he is also the president and CEO of, of the award-winning TechDirt blog, um, in which his insights into the realms of business and technology are the basis for many frequent posts read by probably everybody here in the audience. <laughs> Then to my left is Dr. John Staples. John Sta uh, sorry, John Samples. It's a common thing. <laughs> Sample is a very difficult word to say, so <laughs> thank you. John Samples is a vice president at the Cato Institute. He founded and directs Cato's Center for Representative Government, which studies the First Amendment, government institutional failure, and public opinion. He is the author of The Struggle to Limit Government, a Modern Political History and the fallacy of campaign finance reform. John Samples also manages Cato's adjunct scholar program and oversees the Center for the Study of Science. Prior to joining Cato, Samples served as, for eight years as director of Georgetown University Press, and before that, as president of the 20th Century Fund. And last but not least, my very left is Dr. Whitney Phillips, Whitney Phillips is an assistant professor of literary studies and writing at Mercer University. She holds a PhD in English with a folk folklore structured emphasis um, with a digital culture focus. She's the author of This Is Why We Can't Have Nice Things, mapping the relationship between online trolling and mainstream culture, and the co-author of The Ambivalent Internet, Mischief, Oddity, and Antagonism Online with Ryan M. Milner. Dr. Phillips's work explores antagonism and identity-based harassment, the reciprocal relationship between public expression, corporate and state institutions, and technological affordances, political memes, and other forms of ambivalent civic participation, and digital ethics, including journalistic ethics and ethics of everyday social media use. So clearly we have a very talented panel of people who have much to say on the issues we have to discuss for online trust, tribalism, and transparency. And as a brief bit of background, the impetus for this panel is really our cultural, um, the cultural phenomenon where right now we have seemed to reach a sort of crisis of trust in what society considers to be true or accurate information. We have powerful tech platforms that help us or are designed to help us sort through information. However, those platforms may have inadvertently empowered some people to view information that they prefer, that only reinforces their biases, as opposed to information that is more neutral or allows for uh, more of a traditional sense of media information sharing. So to kick things off, I think we can just start with any of you um, who would like to answer, but in general in recent years, we've seen a decrease in trust in news institutions and the institution of journalism in, as, in general. And this issue is sometimes abbreviated as the fake news problem. So before we discuss the possible solutions and possible ways forward, what are some of the reasons why we may have found ourselves in this position right now? 
I'm well, just listening I would, to <laughs> Okay, I'll start. The, uh, I mean, in general, you've uh, probably for the last 30 or 40 years, cyclically, you've had a decline in confidence in a lot of institutions. Federal government, first of all. I suspect uh, the, as far as news institutions go, it's because you've had uh, an increase in polarization. People tend to believe or not believe and also, and to some extent, tend to have confidence in the federal government or not, depending on partisanship. And that's a result, ultimately, I think, of the fact that you've had a lot of uh, sorting into two parties that you didn't have earlier in my life, but perhaps over the last 30 years or so. So, uh, and maybe in the background, people believe there's just uh, so much that government is about a lot of things and the, the price is very high. So they're willing to pay a high price in terms of a very much in terms of a fight, you know, they're, they can't bear losing. And um, that's the whole background to it, I would think. So in addition to partisanship, anyone else have? Um, I, I mean, I think there, there are a few different things. And I, I obviously, um, I, I don't think there's any one single answer as to why any of this is happening. There's a whole bunch of different variables. But, you know, one thing that I think is definitely true and, and maybe hasn't gotten that much attention uh, among the other ideas that people brought up is, is the fact that, you know, a lot of the news organizations in particular um, have really struggled to sort of understand how to adapt to the internet itself um, and, and have sort of rushed around from idea to idea, um, sort of chasing after what they think is the solution to whatever the problem they think they have is, whether it's, you know, uh, uh, an older business model of subscriptions going away or suddenly everyone, you know, rushing from this platform to that platform. Um, you know, one of the things that, that we've seen is, you know, all these news sources over the last few years in particular sort of rushed to Facebook as sort of like the solution to um, getting attention and potentially getting money. Um, and then Facebook sort of incentivized very much um, this idea of, you know, engagement. So try and figure out ways to in engage and people sort of went with that. Uh, and that's changed over time too. You know, in, in the early days it was, you, you went with sort of the pure like, um, you know, did this happen? Click here to find out kind of clickbait. And then Facebook said, that's no good and we're not gonna promote that. So then everyone sort of changed. And it's just been this constant chasing of, you know, how do we, work with this particular platform to get scale as opposed to how do we grow an audience that actually comes to us directly or is interested in us or is loyal to us. Um, and so you don't have the same sort of community and loyalty that you know, a local newspaper may have built up in the past through you know, repeat uh, interactions between the community and the, and the reporters or the, the staff of the newspaper. Um, and I think a lot of the publications are now sort of suffering from the, the uh, fallout from, from losing that connection directly to the community that, they, that they're targeting. I don't know if you all followed, but in uh, the World Economic Forum, uh, Edelman always releases their trust barometer. And they did that again last week, and they showed trust just falling through the basement, just really in dangerous levels in the US across the board. Um, and my sense is that part of what's happened is there's been this leveling um, of news where people have this implicit understanding of what journalism is, and then there's been this um, propaganda dressed up as journalism, and it's, it's borrowed trust from, from actual journalism, bringing that down while it comes up a little bit. But what's interesting is that in the Edelman Trust Barometer, there seemed to be a little bit of a reversal. They broke out social media from uh, journalism, and journalism had gone up a little bit. I mean, still not at the levels you'd want. And uh, social media had gone down to a near a six-year low. Um, and what's really interesting is we were, we're still getting all this information about um, uh, fake accounts, fake tweets, fake um, news, and it'll be interesting to see what happens with that going forward. But one of the things that um, I like to see, you know, I know the platforms are grappling with this and trying a lot of different ways to separate out journalism without deciding what's true and what's not, as they say. But um, one of the things you can look at is the practice of journalism. I think we all um, have grown up assuming that 
Uh, journalism means that you've got a masthead, so you know who's responsible, and if there's an error, you go and correct it, and that there's a separation between fact and opinion. Um, and so I think the, if we can, if we can say, if we can more clearly label who follows traditional journalistic practice and separate that out in some fashion. So on trending, you don't see uh, organizations that just traffic in opinion and have no real masthead. I think you can do something to correct that. Hi, everyone. Um, so I want to take the sort of shift the conversation a little bit. All of this is, is great, but I think that something really important to think about in this question of how did we get here, um, which of course factors into platform stuff and policy stuff, is the folkloric element of some of the affordances of online spaces. So one of the things that the internet allows people to do is to engage in highly ambivalent behaviors. You don't quite know if what you're looking at is sincere or if it's satire. Um, my co-author and I have theorized that. We talk about it. It's an old internet axiom called Poe's Law, where you just don't know if someone is joking. And so what that does when you have all these people sharing and amplifying on social media information, um, memes, and other content that they may or may not actually believe, that puts journalists in a very complicated position where you know, by debunking a hoax, for example, Pizzagate, where Hillary Clinton was said to be running an under, a child sex ring out of the back of a Washington, D.C. pizza shop, that story, um, you know, while traditional sort of journalistic interventions would be to debunk that story, for those who were forwarding the hoax as a hoax because they were deliberately trying to get under journalist skin, all the debunkings did was take the story and make it into something so much more enormous than it would have been otherwise. And so correctives and basically strategies for responding, it can work for some audiences, but not all audiences who are deliberately looking to manipulate journalists and the broader media ecosystem. So the affordances of online spaces and the ways that those affordances impact citizens' behaviors is a huge part of this conversation that is extremely difficult for journalists or for people at the policy level to know how to respond to, because what do you do when you're not sure that a story is a real story worth responding to and when it's someone just trying to burn their house down for a laugh? Could I just say one more thing? I mean, we should at least consider the possibility that uh, there's nothing wrong with uh, this loss of confidence that, you know, people stopped buying General Motors cars because the cars weren't very good. Maybe it's just the case that the, these institutions have lost people's confidence because they didn't deserve it. Yeah, um, <laughs> I was going to say, I mean, related to that, like, there is a strong argument that that, you know, concepts of media literacy and having people actually understand, you know, how to look over news and determine whether or not it's realistic or not um, is an important skill that maybe people have not paid as much attention to. And so th th that is sort of the optimistic viewpoint of the situation that we're in. But if, if there is this continuing loss of trust, then maybe it leads to uh, an end result of, of greater, greater media literacy as opposed to saying that like somebody else has to sort of step in and, and solve this. Now, it would be nice if there were some sort of intermediary step to help get people to that point where they have greater media, media literacy um, and it helps to sort of rebuild some of that trust. But I think it's, it's a valid point that, you know, we shouldn't rush to suddenly blame, you know, everyone's kind of looking like, well, whose fault is it that, that you know, people don't trust the news and that there's all this fake news or whatever. Um, you know, if, if more people were actually willing to think critically about the stuff that they read, then hopefully that wouldn't be as big a problem. Um, sorry. Uh, so um, I, I, I sort of take objection when people blame the victim. Um, and, and I want to I wanted say that I think... And here the victim is... Journalism. The victim is, no, is, is, sorry, is users, is readers, is citizens. Um, maybe we need some more public education. I'm not, certainly not against um, media literacy. But what's going on right now is a great deal of fraud that is purposely intended to confuse people. And if we ignore that, I think we ignore a big piece of the puzzle. And if we say it's just natural filter bubbles and people aren't paying attention, I mean, the reason that an Infowars or one of these um, sites from Macedonia dress themselves up to look like news is, is because they are trying to borrow from the trust that we have in traditional journalism. They assume that back there in the atavistic part of our brain, we kind of know 
to trust journalism, even if that sunk quite a bit, more than if they spoke in their own name. And so instead of just saying, hey, I'm a guy from Macedonia and this is what I think, they dress it up to look like a piece of journalism. And I think that fraud is really dangerous. And if you just took a look at that New York Times article yesterday that talks about one company in uh, Florida having 200 million fake uh, uh, Twitter followers that you can buy, I mean, there's a great deal of fraud that's happening that's convincing people to trust um, things that look like news as something other than that what they are. Oh, a lot of people follow this. A lot of people think this is important. This looks like news. Uh, that looks like a person. It's not even a person. So before we jump to uh, blaming readers, I think, I think we need to take a look at how there's purposeful manipulation going on. I think that's fair. So it seems like we have a few different themes. Uh, one major theme is a loss in, of trust in institutions, wh whether this be journalism or other institutions, a loss of trust specifically in journalism um, and possibly online journalism. At the same time, we have this other issue of those bad actors who are fueling part of this problem or possibly most of this problem. Um, people who are misusing memes or using internet culture in order to generate this fake news. So it seems like two sort of different but similar and related problems. What are some strategies that could possibly work towards maybe solving either media literacy on the parts of the users and restoring trust or addressing those bad actors? Has anyone seen good solutions or good proposals for those, either of those problems? So I'd like to talk about a general framework here because I think this is the uh, basic issue. And in this area, I mean, we're, this is an area that involves a great deal of political speech. And it takes place in forums in the future and now may well be one of the major forms by which, maybe it already is, by which political speech goes forward. We have a sort of series of principles that have sometimes not been observed, but say for the last 50 or 60 years have been accepted in this area, which really are about a doubt about public uh, actions, about government intervening in this area. And, but at the same time, it's uh, the First Amendment it isn't everywhere. There's a great deal of area for private governance in these areas. Um, and so private governance, that public forums aren't everywhere. And these institutions we're talking about online are not public forums. They are not areas that the First Amendment applies to, and they're also not areas that are, uh, they are beyond the reach of government. They're private forums. So you will be talking about the people who own those forums will be doing the governance. The other thing that bothers, there's a couple things that bother me. There's always the argument in areas like this that was with television and political speech, which is technology has changed rapidly. That's changed everything. Now we need something new like the FCC or we need some kind of uh, government regulation of, uh, in this case, political speech. Um, and I think we already see in this last year what would really be the nightmare here, which is private for governance of these forums, which is, however, actually quite public in the sense that uh, Congress or someone else bullies private owners into doing the policies they want, which then are beyond the reach of the First Amendment. You can't really bring a lawsuit against them. I think that's the concern. The issues of fraud and other things uh, they, those are things that belong, those are the kinds of speech that private governors, the owners of these forums, can get rid of if they want to. They can also get rid of other speech if they want to, because they are the people that make the decisions. Whitney? Yeah, I mean, so I think that responding to bad actors is really important because there are a lot of people who, I mean, there are a lot of people who share fake news stories or who buy into um, conspiracy theories because they, that resonates with them, it aligns with their worldview. They're doing it in a sincere kind of a way. But there are a lot of people who are engaging in these kinds of behaviors and amplifying um, these kinds of messages just to um, wreak havoc. And it is a deliberate, deliberate attempts um, at manipulation. And so I think one of the strategies is to, and I'm working on this, I'm gonna be publishing a piece um, based 
based on 50 ethnographic interviews with reporters I've done over the last um, couple of months that talks about specific reporting or best practices or better practices at least for dealing with manipulators because there are so many people who are actively trying to launder white supremacy or launder false information into the media narrative, various media narratives. And so, so there has to be um, an effort to be able to identify what manipulation looks like and how do you respond to it in a way that does not make manipulators jobs and days easier and better. And that's a tricky thing to do and some of it requires some kind of meta reflection and almost discourse analysis of where does this meme come from and what are people saying about it, what forums is this traveling across, what kinds of meanings has it accrued over time. That's tricky to do in a traditional news article because it, you know, you have to, you're not just telling what happened, the facts, you're going into a little bit more detail that might, than might be normal in a regular, this meme occurred, you know. Um, so it's tricky and it's going to require some um, figuring out how do you balance going into this backstory and then reporting what happens because just reporting on what happens often is the number one way of getting manipulative information into the media ecosystem. So that's something that um, you know, everybody, and even people on social media, this is not just about journalists, everyone is capable of amplifying. So we've got to think about sort of more ethical approaches um, to the process of amplification and the role that we all play, everyday citizens and journalists and policymakers alike, every, the role we all play in that process of manipula manipulation campaigns. Okay, so it sounds like, Whitney, you're speaking about possible solutions or steps forward that journalists can take, journalist organizations, and also individual people, right? Um, and that kind of, I think, works fairly well with what, John, you were mentioning, where the tech companies can self-govern and um, solve all these problems on their own, right? Does this work, Karen, with what you were mentioning earlier about not blaming the users? Is calling for users and people, individual journalists, to improve upon themselves does that work with what you were saying earlier, or is that part of that problem that you mentioned? Well, you know, I think I think it's true that there's a lot that the um, platforms can do on their own, and they have started to do it. And and you know, there's there's some uh, job for policymakers. You know, Eric Schneiderman in New York City, New York State, just decided that he's just announced he's going after this company in Florida that was written about yesterday with the uh, fraudulent followers. So, you know, to the extent you've got fraud, there are things that can be done against fraud. Often it, it violates terms of service of the internet companies. Um, so there's fraud and then there's transparency. Um, you know, when Citizens United, uh, what decision was uh, arrived at by the Supreme Court, the majority wrote, this was in 2010, that we didn't have to worry about corporations and unions giving unlimited sums to candidates because we now have the internet, and the internet was going to give us infinite amount of transparency, so you would always know if a candidate was in the pocket of some business. So the, the internet has held out this promise of a tremendous amount of transparency, and I still believe it can provide that, but unfortunately what's happened is um, dictators and terrorists and dark political money have grabbed the, the megaphone and drown out a lot of individual speech. And that's, again, they do it sort of hiding behind a curtain so you can't tell that they're doing it. So I think we have to go back and introduce a lot of transparency. And obviously there's the, a bill in Congress. Uh, the internet platforms are grappling with, with how to introduce more transparency. But I think that's, that's really imperative. Um. I mean, I, I, in general, I certainly agree that transparency is, is really important and more transparency in a lot of these things are, will be really, really helpful. You know, but to some extent, you know, like the situation that just came out this weekend about the fake Twitter followers, like that was a form of transparency. It was reported on the New York Times and, and a bunch of people ended up looking really bad because they had purchased all of these Twitter followers and now suddenly, you know, whether or not Schneiderman has any actual basis to go after them on, um, I'm not sure that anyone right now, this week, would be buying new Twitter followers from that company in Florida, just recognizing that, um, you know, anyone else who gets on that list is going to end up looking really bad in, in the long run. Um, and so, you know, there's there's an argument that some of this, you know, if it's outright fraud, um, you know, then, there, then there's, you know, a reasonable space for, for 
whether it's state AGs or the FTC or whoever to go after them, um, if it's just, you know, slightly deceptive practices, if, it can, if there is good reporting and it comes out, that it has a, the possibility of being fairly self-correcting. Um, one other element on this, I'll, I'll tell a very, very quick story that just happened like a half an hour ago, um, which was that, uh, it amazed me about the whole question of like fake news and stuff. Um, we had posted a story a, a couple hours ago about the whole 5G nationalization thing, which everybody here has been talking about. You heard about it, hopefully. Um, and, you know, we went through the details of why it was never actually going to happen. And, um, and somebody responded on Twitter saying fake news to, to our post uh, and linked to another story in which, you know, the White House has denied it. And of course, in our post, we had mentioned that the White House has denied it and, and all the, this kind of stuff. And um, even that Twitter user from, from the, the avatar that that user had, I assumed that the person was not um, amenable to reason. Uh, but... <laughs> Uh, I, I still try and I just said, hey, you know, did you actually read the post? Because we uh, addressed that. And he came back and sort of was like, yeah, but blah, 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 and all this stuff. And I said, yes, all of those things are actually in the post. Have you read the post? And he said, yes. And I said, well, then what was fake news in the post? And he says, okay, I'm deleting my tweet. <laughs> Which, now, this may not be a regular occurrence, but it was a, a fairly amazing thing where, like, by actually engaging with the person at a somewhat human level, kind of, um, they were able to recognize that maybe, you know, they shouldn't have jumped to this, like, fake news conclusion, and you could actually make a connection and, and get somewhere. Now, that is obviously sort of a one-on-one -on -one solution. It doesn't scale and doesn't take on people who are deliberately trying to, to, to mislead. But I think that, you know, I, I do worry about the framing of, of, like, the fake news debate as this sort of massive problem that, that lumps in all different kinds of things from, you know, misleading stories to errors that get corrected to actually malicious players who are trying to mislead. Each of those are very different issues with very different, um, you know, responses and, and ways to deal with them. And yet, by sort of, you know, labeling them as this sort of large overreaching problem, people sort of try and jump in with these large overreaching solutions that tend to only solve a part of it and often make lots of other things much worse. Um, so I, I kind of went all over the place with that. I, I've said that I, I think the, the owners of the forums uh, are empowered here, but I think we also run a risk of thinking this is too, a lot easier than it actually is. And, and we tend to think of Pizzagate and all of that sort of thing, conspiracy theories. Uh, do you remember a man named James Hotkinson? Do does anyone remember him? Uh, last year, on June 14th, he tried to kill the leadership cadre of the House of Representatives of the Republicans in Virginia. Prior to that day, uh, the months running up to that, he had uh, been on Facebook where he was a member of a group with the time to destroy Trump and company, but it, and then a bunch of related stuff like that. Uh, at the same time, he was an avid watcher of MSNBC and related channels. And he, uh, his favorite movie was the documentary Inequality for All featuring uh, Bob Reich, a Berkeley professor. So my question for all of us, including me, uh, it's pretty clear what the answer if you're a government official. You can't do anything about this guy on June 13th, 2017. What, if you're the head of uh, Facebook or you make policy for any of those tech companies. On June 13th, what do you do about James Hodgkinson? That's the tough question. Well, but doesn't that sort of assume that the, that violence stems from the online behavior? It, it assumes that there's some sort of connection between the online behavior and then the embodied violence? But that's true of the conspiracy theories, true, right? I mean, there's not every conspiracy theorist tries to, and he actually shot the ceiling of the basement, I think, of the pizza place. But not everybody, um, and there is that odd thing about him too, he was doing what Enlightenment theorists want him to do. He was investigating to get his own information, as he said at the time. He just happened to have a gun with him, um, and he used it. But the, yeah, I think it's, there's a lot of conspiracy theorists that aren't acted on, right? Oh, sure. oh, there no, no doubt. But just had that man not been on the internet, is the argument that he would not have undertaken that violent act. 
Right, but I think these are the kinds of things that focus people on regulating speech and worry people about the Internet. But his particular point was that actually in more normal kinds of media, he, he was also similarly engaged. It was all normal behavior is what makes him a hard case, I think. I mean, those are a lot of difficult cases, and many people have worked, um, I think, within those companies on these issues. A colleague of mine at Yale Law School recently completed um, a large-scale project studying Facebook, Twitter, Google, and other companies like this. Uh, Kate Klonick, she wrote a paper called The New Governors, and it's about the ways in which these companies govern themselves internally. Uh, it's fascinating inter and research to read. Uh, they have you know, their own governing bodies structured almost similar to our own government. Um, but there are many of these cases, you know, thousands if not millions almost every day where they have to look at speech and determine, you know, is something really dangerous or not. Uh, so I, I really one last can't comment um, very quickly. Um, and then after that, we'll open the floor to questions. I was just going to say, read the Klonic paper. It's fabulous. That was a great comment to end on. Um, so if you have anyone in the audience have questions. Hey, Tiffany, can I just say one thing? I, sure. I, I, I just want to respond to the idea that it's just so difficult and that, they, that almost all of this is a First Amendment issue. I think before we get to any difficult First Amendment issues, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that we can do. So just as a user, when you think you're talking to a person, you should be talking to a person. You know, when you, you shouldn't be talking to a bot. Like, that, that shouldn't be that hard. That's not a First Amendment issue. That's not a privacy issue. When you think you're looking at something that's a, a, a news piece that actually follows journalistic practices, it could follow, you could know. I mean, maybe you want to read something else, but you should know what kind of journalistic practices that follows. If you're looking at an ad, a political ad, you should be able to know, A, that it's an ad, that it's sponsored, and who's paying for it. Like, those kinds of things stop way short of any First Amendment problems. Those are things the platforms can do by themselves. If, if that's not possible, there, there are things that regulators could look at. Um, but I, I think there's a lot we can do before we get into tough decisions where a platform is deciding what's true and what's not true. And, and then there's the whole hate speech problem. I mean, and, and then there's all of those issues, which they have, they do do when it comes to terrorism. And I think there's, that there are some tougher issues, but still there's a lot that can be done there. That's true. There are those easy cases um, and many things that could be done without having to determine, you know, what is good speech. Um, but yes, questions, Hillary, can you help? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hi, uh, I'm Mark McCarthy with uh, SIIA in Georgetown, and uh, I want to pick up on things that I think the two of you, Karen and Mike, were, were suggesting, which is um, there are lots of different issues that are sort of scattered in and among what sounds like one issue. Um, there was a, a, a great paper Depay and Ghosh and Ben Scott just put out a couple of days ago, which I recommend to all of you on disinformation campaigns. Uh, on social media, and the conclusion is, is it's hard to tell the difference between a diff disinformation campaign and a regular advertising campaign. So here, here's one example of distinguishing issues. We need transparency, we need to know who's speaking or whether it's a person at all. Uh, but categorizing the speaker as engaged in fake news or disinformation is a totally different step. And so when you're thinking about um, regulation for transparency, you shouldn't be thinking about how to solve the disinformation problem. It would be like saying in the old broadcast world, what we need to do is make sure the FCC can figure out who's a Soviet a agent who's impersonating someone who's contributing to a okay, political wait. campaign. I'm going to wonk out with Mark here for a second. So, um, you know what I keep thinking about is the payola rules. Payola rules in the broadcast world, where, um, for those of you who aren't 100 years old like I am, um, Paola started in the radio days when um, a disc jockey would be playing a song because the musician or his manager uh, was giving him a bribe. And that was deemed not okay, that you couldn't pretend to be airing it because you, the trusted disc jockey, thought this was a good song, but in fact were being paid off. And so um, rules were put in place that you had to disclose if somebody was paying you for some content. So on television, you know, which has its own very particular regulatory scheme that comes out of its own history, but still we had these debates about, gee, let's figure out if something is being sponsored or if it's organic. Uh, then we said, um, let's disclose 
who paid for the ad. Um, and let's make that searchable. And there are a lot of problems with that, but we had these societal debates that said, this incredibly important medium is gonna influence democratic debate. Let's think about what kind of transparency we need to have. And so I think that's really important. I, I do recommend the Ben Scott um, paper very much. Um, but you know, I, do, I think that there's, um, again, I think that, that, that without getting into what's good speech, what's bad speech, there's a lot of stuff that we can do. Um, just really quickly on that, I, I think um, in response to, I think there is a good point there with the payola. It, it is also worth noting then kind of what happened, which was once they sort of made that uh, illegal, it sort of, they kept figuring out ways to continue to do payola, and then they would have to crack down on it again. So it's it's not, it's not th those aren't simple solutions, but you know, there is something that is important and effective in terms of making these things more transparent. And I think that is something that the platforms can and should choose to do to, to increase the sort of the knowledge level and the media literacy that people can have by, by having that information and having people to go through it. In terms of the, the, the sort of difficult questions, um, you know, I think it's something that finally, you know, more and more platforms are realizing that they've been kind of going it alone and trying to answer each of these questions on their own um, for the past, you know, however many years and are suddenly realizing like reinventing the wheel on a really, really difficult problem um, is is an issue. And I know like um, some of you may know this already, but later this week um, out back in California where I'm from uh, at Santa Clara University, they're doing a, a a, uh, an event called like content moderation at scale where they're actually getting companies to present and part of the deal with presenting is like you actually have to present real stuff about what you're actually doing and start to have a discussion around this so that there's some best practices and ideas uh, going around and hopefully that leads to some, some better practices among the companies. There's, I would like to make the point that uh, there's a distinction between forcing uh, disclosure of uh, contributions or buying ads and forcing disclosure of the uh, identity of people. And it's rooted in the Constitution, or at least constitutional law. Uh, the uh, payments or spending on ads has been upheld. But in the 1990s, in a case out of Ohio, the Supreme Court recognized a right of anonymity uh, to people, and she was spreading uh, ads around that attacked the local school board. Uh, but there's not much reason to think in constitutional law you can force people to, to reveal their identity. And it seems to me also there's a lot of policy reasons. There would be a lot, you might be thinking about Russians or whatever, but there's going to be a lot of false positives, and those false positives are going to be people who are, have unpopular speech or people who are going to get attacked for that speech. They may have good reasons to re remain anonymous, and who knows, they might even choose the name Publius. Hi, Steve Dalbianca with NetChoice. Karen Cornblue, I think, made an excellent, simple suggestions that are workable for platforms that stop well short of censorship. But Karen, I wonder if you could expand on one element. You said that political ads should bear disclosure of the source. But what would be the definition of political ads that a private company like Facebook, Twitter could use? Is it just ads regarding a candidacy, an election? Or how much broader does that get without falling way down a slippery slope into any ad that has anything to do with a public policy issue? That's a great question. You know, and then it does get hard. So there are definitions in law already. Uh, so I think the Warner-Klobuchar bill uses just the, the definitions that are in law about um, how many days before a general election, how many days before a primary, do you say vote for, vote against, you know, those kinds of things. So that's a no-brainer. But then what do you do about the issue ads? Because so much of what happened in the election was issue ads. And, you know, the, 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 the example that keeps sticking in my head is when they organized uh, the Russian-linked uh, groups organized fake groups in Houston. There was Hearts of Texas, which was the Russian secessionist fake group, and um, United Muslims of America, the fake opposing group, and the Russian two fake groups organized competing rallies on a day in May in Houston in front of the Islamic Center. So Americans went out and rallied against each other, having been ginned up by these two fake accounts. You know, that, that kind of disclosure doesn't necessarily work there. So I'm not, I, I've been grappling with, that's, that's of course, Steve, you always pick the great 
question. That's a really tough one. And I think some of the platforms are, are thinking, I know Twitter floated this idea of just being, I don't think they figured out how to do it, but should we be transparent about everything? You know, if you're, if you're a page on Facebook, if you're an account should you have, that's buying ads, should you have to reveal who you are in any case? You know, may, maybe that's where they want to go. Um, you know, uh, but but I think that 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 is where it gets a little bit dicey. There's one, there's a, a bunch that's easy that we can do now, and then there's some tougher questions that they'll they'll have to grapple with. One well, just one quick point. I mean, there's always trade-offs, and one of the things about disclosure is it's bound to. She mentioned tribalism. It's bound to increase tribalism, isn't it? Because people are going to judge everything by who you are rather than what you say. I think we have a few more minutes. So um, I, th I think I saw two hands. Can we get both questions on a row and then the speakers can choose how to answer? Hi, Amy Stepanovich from Access Now. Um, there was a, a couple points made about that seemed to me to trigger the difference between legitimate and illegitimate journalism and trying to make some distinction between those two elements. And in an age of blogging and investigative research that is not being done at the major platforms. I want to know how we're making those distinctions, who's making those distinctions, because if it's coming from the platforms, personally, I don't know if I'm comfortable with that, and what transparency obligations we're imposing on the entities making those distinctions and how those transparency obligations are being imposed. Um, because while that question, I think, is very important in the US context. When you get into the international context where most of the major media platforms are owned by foreign governments, that question becomes immeasurably important. And these policies are not only going to be picked up in the US, they'll be global. And we had one more. a lot of journalists today. I work for the Committee to Protect Journalists. And I think that one of the things we hear a lot about is the need for transparency from these companies. And yet, you know, they're routinely are not providing access to lists of content or accounts that are removed under efforts to combat various things like hate speech or countering violent extremism or fake news or whatever the issue du jour is. So how can we put more pressure on them to open up the list of accounts and content that's, that are removed under these efforts so that they're subject to independent audit and review? It seems if we're talking about self-regulation, we need to have more powerful systems. Similarly, we hear, and I'm just actually chatting right now with a journalist in Egypt who are constantly being attacked by what appear to be government-sponsored attempts to get their accounts removed. It's very labor intensive to do this by one, you know, one by one on journalists. And of course, if they know an organization who can interface with them, that's great. But I have never met a single journalist or activist in my decade of working um, on this topic who has ever effectively used one of the automated remedies available. So how do we address the remedy aspect? Those are great questions. Uh, Whitney, do you want to start? Oh, goodness. <laughs> um, I mean, so the first question about sort of legitimate and illegitimate journalism, um, that's a really tricky one because for a large swath of the population, um, and again, this falls into the, the murky area of it's not quite clear who's being really sincere in this and who's taking on this position per performatively to convince others of this position. So it's a little confusing. But there's a big group of people who look at any attempt of establishment media to be more transparent and to really show um, where they get their information and to do good journalism, basically, that many, many people, a huge group of people, look at any of those efforts as proof that something is false. So you've got a group of people who look at good journalism, legitimate journalism. I'm assuming that many of us in this room have a kind of a working agreement about what legitimate journalism is versus illegitimate. But when you're talking about groups of people who have a totally inverted worldview about what counts and what doesn't, solutions on one side are only going to prove to be poisons on the other and vice versa. So, you know, if you are more careful and transparent about your sourcing, for example, in a particular conspiracy theory. That is only going to drive the conspiracy theory deeper because then you need a conspiracy theory to rest your conspiracy theory on and then it's conspiracy theories all the way down. And that becomes very difficult to try to respond to with legitimate journalism because where do you even start with that if the second that you open your mouth to say 
something happened in the world and is true, that's proof that it didn't. What, how, do you, how do you respond to that effectively? So I think that that already makes distinguishing just the question of legitimacy and illegitimacy tricky because for different people, those two concepts are totally inverted. They, they're, people are not talking the same, speaking the same language about that. So that's, that's um, incredibly tricky. To the second question, in this um, research that I did, one of the things that became really clear was that harassment of journalism, whether it's state-sponsored or individuals, that attacks against journalism is a really effective way. Um, it's sort of a narrative Trojan horse. It's a really effective way to bring misinformation into the news cycle because if you have attacks against journalists, well, what often happens is that then there are more stories about those attacks against those journalists. And so then the manipulation campaign or the attack, it gets more attention, more people brought to the fold, more stories about it, more stories about those stories. And it becomes kind of, it gets out of control. And so figuring out a way, how do you deal with, for one thing, harassment against journalism, against journalists, that is a, an issue of embodied safety, and it is important to protect journalists' safety and, and bodily autonomy. So number one, it's a labor issue that needs to be addressed, but it also is a really effective way of incentivizing abuse against journalists and making it so that, that uh, manipulative misinformation campaigns stay in the news longer. So it's doubly critical that we find ways to deal with specifically attacks against journalists. That's a lot, sorry. That was great. John, do you have anything to add? Uh, I was just thinking about, the, there's been an undertone here, I think, that I would probably contest, which is legitimate and illegitimate journalism, which makes me think about uh, Citizens United, which we started with. Uh, Citizens United became apparent rather quickly and was apparent to Justice Kennedy that actually so legitimate journalism is a corporation. So if you're not going to allow independent corporations to uh, spend money on speech as they wanted, didn't that include the press, too. My point here being, I think I wouldn't lean too heavily on the difference between legitimate and illegitimate journalism, because it's, what she said is correct for people outside this room, many, many of them, well, around 60 million of them, it doesn't seem to be a distinction that holds much uh, difference. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I mean, I, I think um, oftentimes people think that these are very simple distinctions to make between legitimate or illegitimate journalism, and it turns out to be much, much more difficult than people think. Um, and, I mean, you know, one of the examples, and I've gone back to this one a lot um, in, in my writing, but there are lots of other examples, too, is like, you know, there was the, the effort five or six years ago to get YouTube to take down um, terrorist propaganda videos. And of course, what happened like a few weeks after YouTube agreed to start doing that was that they pulled down uh, uh, an account that was documenting war crimes in Syria. And you take a step back and you say, how do you determine the difference between terrorist propaganda and documenting war crimes? It gets very, very tricky very, very quickly. Um, and you know, you have that the same situation then when you're when you're dealing with, you know, how these things turn around and come back to you know, when you give, basically when you give someone the tools to sort of, you know, shut down, um, you know, a, a publication or a reporter or anything like that, they, they, they get used in that way and often not the way we want. You know, we had a story not too long ago that looked at a bunch of um, accounts that were suspended by Facebook and Twitter um, and in almost a, a, where every one of those cases where those individuals sort of reporting on somebody basically trying to harass or abuse them. And just by them reporting on it triggered whatever this or you know whatever AI was being used or whoever was reviewing, without you know taking into account the context of it. And those people were the ones who had their accounts removed. And so, you know, what feels like easy problems to solve, we say like oh like you know illegitimate content shouldn't be allowed or something like that, gets very very difficult very very quickly, and you start down a very slippery slope um, that that we should be very careful about. Hi, so I want to make a distinction between uh, illegitimate content and practices. So what, what I was talking about is if there are certain journalistic practices that a bunch of, um, that either the platforms uh, agree could be segmented off or just a bunch of journalism journalists want to sign on to and say, look, we have a masthead, we correct corrections, um, we separate fact from opinion, 
uh, and here we're going to we're going to uh, subscribe to this code of conduct. You can read whatever else you want, but but here, but if something's in trending, if something looks like an article, it's going to follow a, pract a practical code. That's different than the content. Um, so I just want to make that distinction. But I do think there's some really hard issues that have been raised. So one, the issue of, so you've got a government that's in control, and the government goes through its legal processes and tells you to take down speech. Really tough issue that I think the platforms are, are dealing with. You know, in our ideal world, that would not happen. I think they're trying to, you know, give some kind of transparency around that, and they're grappling with that. But those are very troubling issues. And then there's the other where malicious folks are drowning out speech. So Myanmar is this horrible example where this radical cleric and even people in the military and even the spokesperson for the leader are um, putting up lies and accusing the Rohingya of all kinds of things and they're being killed and they're being forced to flee. Uh, and that's another First Amendment problem because the truth is being drowned out. Uh, those are those are really tough issues about what do you take down, when do you take it down, and I think I think Facebook has taken down some of the stuff of this cleric, but then they haven't discontinued his account. He's back up again. But they've also taken down the other side, which is the people who are right. taking, I guess it had right. some of their accounts taken down too. So it, it, it you know right. And, but and I would in, just separate in the, that in the heat of the matter, you know. To expect Facebook to be the one to sort of balance that out becomes very tricky. Is is just the right? Point. But I don't. I guess what I would say about those issues. First of all, I would separate them from journalistic practice issues. Sure. But what I would also say about those issues is, is they're hard, but we can't look the other way. Those two issues about lies online that are causing people to, you know, they're causing a genocide according to the UN, or you know, that situation that you talked about in Egypt of taking down the journalists. Those kinds of things are hard, but we can't ignore it. Those are really important. Like, we, if we decide that, you know, democracy and democratic debate are being fundamentally undermined and there's nothing we can do about it, you know, that, that, that's, we can't be there. That, that's not the place to be. Okay, thank you. So I think just to close out the session, um, I would love it if, um, if each of you could give a very quick, maybe one or two lines about one major takeaway that you think um, that this audience should leave this panel knowing. And I can start, so you have some time to think about it, though you, <laughs> all of you are very experienced speakers, you don't need any time. Um, but before I end the session, I do have to put a quick plug in for um, the Yale Law School Information Society Project, where I am a resident fellow. If you're more interested in these issues, we do have a report on our website um, about this fake news workshop that we hosted last year. And we're doing more research through the Wikimedia and Yale Law School Initiative on intermediaries and information. So if you're interested, check out our website. Um, my very quick takeaway, though, is that I do think that the internet can still be a force for good and a force for global democratic values. So even though there are problems, I think they're fixable. And let's start, Karen. Um, yeah, I, so I'll just agree with you. I, I, um, I think we were maybe internet utopians before, and maybe now we're internet realists, uh, and we're having the kind of debate about um, this very important issue of disinformation and democracy. And uh, obviously, we're going to have to address it. Um, the, the internet companies are going to hopefully do um, much of the, the heavy lift, and hopefully we can uh, do it all without making too many hard trade-offs. Um, but I think we're having the right kind of conversation. I don't think we have to become internet pessimists. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm still optimistic also. <laughs> um, but I mean, just as a, a final simple point, I think I would just make the point that, that um, almost any simple solution that anyone comes up with is going to fail and probably cause more problems than, than, uh, than you think. And, and yet we keep hearing people sort of coming up with, with simple solutions. But I do think that it is important to be talking about these things and to be thinking about these things and thinking about ways to, to improve um, you know, things that are, are clearly issues uh, you know, around that. And I'll put in a second plug for the, for the, the conference in Santa Clara uh, 
um, that's later this week. And, and, and a small plug for my own site, which obviously everybody already reads, so you already see this. But um, <coughs> from that conference that's, that's happening this Friday, many of the participants have, have written up um, essays or, or papers, and we're publishing all of them over the next couple of weeks, that many of which touch on the topics that are being discussed here. So uh, check that out. So three points. One would be that I think that a traditional American understanding of freedom of speech and constraints on government is a good one. And it's uh, the second point would be nothing about the technological change has led us to invite government in to make speech better or any number of other things that uh, might be proposed in the next few years. And I'm generally an optimist too, but my pessimism would be that you, what we've seen in the last six months or so will be the future, which is that private companies make decisions about speech on their platforms while being bullied by government. And that would be a bad outcome. All right, so mine is when we're trying to contend with the various challenges that we're, we're all faced with in various ways, I think it's critical to recognize the extent to which all of it is interconnected, that when you're talking about issues with the news, you also have to talk about issues with policy, and you also have to talk about issues in popular culture and on social media. All of these things are feeding into each other. There's not going to be one solution in one sector. We got to do it all at once, unfortunately. <laughs> Hooray. Um, on that note, we're, we can break for coffee, but before yes, that, I'd like everyone um, to give a round of applause to our panelists. Thank you. 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 Thank you.